So welcome to fiscal policy, a key area in economics and indeed a very controversial area for governments. So what is fiscal policy? Well, we have a definition here, basically use of government spending, taxation and borrowing uh, to affect or achieve a certain level of aggregate demand, output and employment. And indeed there are really four facets to fiscal policy. First of all, there's demand management, the sort of Keynesian approach, uh, which is often short run, where governments can affect aggregate demand, the level of aggregate demand in the economy. We'll go through that in a second. But also, it's very important to bear in mind that fiscal policy has a supply side impact. And indeed, governments have emphasised this in the recent decades, since the 80s really. Uh, so whenever you have a fiscal policy to do taxation or government expenditure, it will often have a supply side impact in the long run, and we'll come back to that. Also, um, from microeconomics, you may realise that it corrects um, microeconomic market failure. So people consuming too much alcohol or demerit good or smoking too much, then that overconsumption can be taxed with excise duty, for example. Um, or there's underconsumption of something like uh, the Royal Opera House, then that can be subsidised. So uh, it can correct market failure. Uh, and the fourth area, which is incredibly important, and, and again uh, an area of contention between right and left, is the role of taxation in redistribution of income and wealth. Um, so what we'll focus on is um, a few key definitions you need. First of all, what is a budget deficit? Well, basically, a budget deficit, usually measured over a year, is when government expenditure is greater than taxation. If you think of fiscal policy to do with GMT, like gin and tonic, then it's to do, um, that might help you remember it. And um, that's just an experiment. If we make the gin stronger, so pretend this is gin and tonic, or we pour a bit of gin in, pretend this is gin, then we made it stronger, and that should actually reflate the economy, and that will create a budget deficit. Well, as we pour more tonic in, we have more taxation and we reduce government expenditure. We might move towards a budget surplus um, and the gin and tonic will be weaker. So a budget surplus is when you have tax revenue is greater than government expenditure. A budget deficit is when tax revenue is less than government expenditure. And indeed a balanced budget is when they're both equal. Now if you look at history, you will find that governments don't particularly often have budget surpluses. They tend to have budget deficits. So they like a strong gin and tonic. Hope you like the joke. Okay, so um, make sure you're aware that a deficit or a surplus is measured over a year. That's what economists often call the flow concept. But what is the national debt? And that is the total accumulated past borrowing of the government. So you add up all the budget deficits or take off the budget surplus, you get to your national debt. So imagine in year one, it was uh, we had a budget deficit of minus 10 billion. In year two, minus 15 billion. Okay? So at the end of year two, we're going to have a national debt of 25 billion. So in total, that's what the government owes to bondholders. Um, so the national debt um, is often expressed as a percentage of GDP. And if you're reaching something like 100% of GDP for your national debt, that is pretty high. Um, so, what we um, also need to know is what is a reflationary fiscal stance? And that is simply um, when the government boosts aggregate demand okay, by cutting taxation and or increasing government expenditure. And what is a deflationary fiscal stance? Simply the opposite. The government increases taxes and or re um, reduces government expenditure. So, um, but that's a reflationary but fiscal stance sometimes called an expansionary fiscal policy and a deflationary fiscal stance is sometimes called a contractionary fiscal policy. So they both have multiplier effects. When you, when you comment on this, you can often talk about the multiplier effect, uh, which will produce a bigger change in income than the initial change in government expenditure. See the video on the multiplier uh, for more detail on that one. So but we could draw it on a, a simple ADAS diagram. So here we have, we start at AD1. If we have a reflationary fiscal stance, we'll shift to AD2. Now notice what will happen. Output will increase, but 
in support to comment that the price level, the, the, the level of inflation, may well increase too, um, depending on the output gap situation. And if we have a deflation in fiscal policy, the opposite will tend to happen. Aggregate demand will shift to the left, because then we have a negative multiplier process. And output will fall from Y1 to Y3, but we gain, as a trade-off, we gain from lower inflation. So whenever you talk about reflationary or deflationary fiscal position, um, there's often a trade-off in terms of inflation compared to output and employment. Of course, when output goes up, employment tends to increase as well. Now, we could be a little more sophisticated and draw a more complicated diagram for putting the longer and aggregate supply chain. Now, of course, if we're to the left of this, we have a negative output gap, and we can increase aggregate demand, and the likely impact is not going to be that great on inflation because we've got the spare capacity in the economy. And that's the sort of thing you, is worth commenting on. However, if we're actually on the long and aggregate supply line and we shift aggregate demand to the right from 81 to 82, then what it does is the economy is probably overheating. We have a positive output gap where the actual output is greater than potential output, and of course we're at Y2. Uh, by overheating, we mean that inflation is likely to take off, and of course, costs will then increase. Um, as a result of costs increasing, then the short of supply, short of aggregate supply, will shift to the left. Okay, and guess what? We get back to where we started in terms of potential output, but we simply end up with more inflation in the economy. So, for governments to use uh, a reflationary fiscal stance, um, it could well just result in more inflation, or it could result in significant increase in output, depending on where we are, whether there's a, a negative output gap or not. Uh, and that's good evaluation to consider those, those points. Okay, so we've looked now at the really demand management, but it's important also to consider there'll often be a time lag with fiscal policy, because if we cut taxes, it takes people to time to adjust their behaviour. And indeed, if consumer confidence is low and we cut income tax, it might be that consumption doesn't increase significantly, but maybe savings increases. Um, so it is not always effective. Um, um, also, can the government borrow more to reflate the economy and run a budget deficit? Well, it depends whether a, a lenders, the bond markets, are willing to lend the government money at a low rate of interest. Um, okay, so it's not plain sailing. And, and in fact, normally until 2008, governments left demand management to the central bank via monetary policy. See the video on monetary policy for that. So another aspect of fiscal policy that people have neglected until the last few decades um, and is, is important is the effect on the supply side of the economy. So if we look at taxes, if we cut income taxes, um, for example, we cut the top rate of income tax, then this increases, supposedly increases the incentive to work because the um, Marginal rate of tax people pay will fall and therefore it makes work worth more worthwhile because people's disposable income will increase. So they give up that leisure time, they give up that time uh, drinking in the pub or uh, playing golf or playing tennis and they go off and work harder. Um, this assumes people can vary the number of hours they work, but this inc encourages work effort and um, <coughs> the, the, it should boost, therefore, the competitiveness of an economy. And indeed, if you reduce income tax rates, it could encourage people to get a job if you cut taxes at a lower level so that people, so, so that unemployment will, will fall. Um, corporation tax cuts. The corporation tax is a tax on profits. And if you cut these, it could encourage firms to invest more. Again, depending on business confidence. And it could also encourage foreign direct investment um, into a country if you um, reduce corporation taxes. Indeed, governments tend to compete to some extent on corporation taxes, so there's a bit of a race to the bottom um, so that they can gain foreign direct investment. And then we've got lower employment taxes, so in the UK, key tax is national insurance, which is paid by the employer and the employee. And this is effectively a tax on jobs. If we increase that, then the firms have greater costs, so if we reduce employment taxes, they have lower employment costs. Therefore, 
they become more profitable, may invest more, and that increases, could increase productivity. Also, it could increase employment uh, and help reduce the level of unemployment, of course. And then there's another example, might be fuel tax cuts. Well, this um, will clearly cut business costs, especially for businesses that use a lot of energy, a lot of fuel, and um, that cuts costs, potentially increases productivity, increases competitiveness. However, um, it's hardly going to help a government meet its environmental targets uh, in terms of cutting CO2 emissions. Okay, so those are examples of tax cuts. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is uh, if you cut taxes, then you might have to borrow more. Can you afford? To, can, can the government do that? Or cut government expenditure, and there are going to be consequences for that as well um, in terms of public services. So if we look at government expenditure, we'll just choose two fairly straightforward examples. If we look at education and training, okay, then these basically should improve the skills and productivity of the labour force. It, they should increase what we call human capital. Um, they lead to people who are more educated, more skilled and more productive workers. And so if people are retrained, for example, could learn structural unemployment. It could lead to more innovation as we have more highly educated people producing goods and services. Um, and just a little problem, um, what happens if we increase the number of graduates of ancient history? Not that I've got anything against ancient history, of course, but will that actually boost the productivity of the UK economy? Well, I think it is debatable, and we need to look at where the expenditure is and how targeted it is in terms of producing um, economic dividends, in terms of increased productivity. Um, coming to infrastructure, so airport, rail, road, um, these are key areas of infrastructure that only the government can provide because sometimes they're loss making, at least initially. Uh, and if you, um, say, put in a new railway, high speed railway, such as high speed 2, then this increases productivity, um, sorry, increases connectivity, it increases mobility, and it should reduce government business costs. And, and therefore, um, it should lead to increased productivity in the economy. For example, businesses in the UK lose billions of pounds as a result of congestion where people and goods sit still on roads um, and therefore this increases business costs quite considerably. So infrastructure can make a big difference. Okay. However, the problem is um, we need to buy build infrastructure that will be used, that will be fully utilised. Um, so a motorway in the middle of nowhere um, won't partic might be part of regional policy, but it might have a big impact in terms of productivity. Uh, and the key thing is there's a time lag. Um, most of these supply side type fiscal policies tend to take a long time before they boost productivity and competitiveness for an economy, or indeed incentives in the case of tax cuts. Um, also, um, how are we going to pay for them? More borrowing? Or is it necessary to raise taxes? And if you raise the wrong taxes, it might create disincentives which actually cancel, cancel out the gains in, in productivity. Um, so that's something to weigh up. And of course, um, waste. You know, we, we could potentially waste public sector money on education or infrastructure that made little difference. So this spending needs to be targeted. Um, so it's important to evaluate different aspects of the supply side of uh, aspects of f fiscal policy. Okay, so basically key aspects of that fiscal policy are the demand side and the supply side. I hope that's useful. Thank you.